So this transaction cost, it might be $30. It's far less than a termite inspection. But it, require, it generates a motivated seller so that the year before you, you were thinking of selling your house, you actually make energy efficient improvements that goes to the resale value of the house. It creates a more informed buyer because in that zip code you can say this is the range of energy in the house and the house you're looking at is over here. So it's a refrigerator label. And, and when you're buying the house, if you turn the structural inspection to also a competent energy audit as well, you'd be motivated to make the improvements as you're moving into the home and you can stick that on your standard mortgage and make it seamless. And so there are things like this. If, if we can get these things to work, it will have a profound effect in the United States because five million homes are bought and sold in the United States each year out of 120. And so over 10 or 20 years, you've actually retrofitted the United States. There'll certainly be some homes where people live 30 or 40 years and we can get to them through the block parties. But, but the point here is that we need to invent things like this in order to make it uh, the norm. Okay, we should deploy low carbon technologies we have. A magnificent example of a great technology developed in Europe, unfortunately, are these wind turbines. The reason they were developed in Europe is Europe generated very stable support policies that went over decades. Whereas in the United States, they're on again, off again. Every other year they would appear and then disappear. And so US companies said, we're not, you know, the United States doesn't appear to be in it for the long haul, but, not, but Europe actually provided uh, tax credits and other subsidies. Because of that, the cost of wind generation went down by more than a factor of 10 over 20 years. This is a large turbine generator offshore somewhere in Europe. It's pretty big. How big? Well, it generates 6 million watts of peak power. The diameter of the rotors is 126 meters. How big is that? Well, soccer field's 100 meters, but let me put it in more perspective. That's the biggest flying plane now in the skies is 747-400. Its wingspan is less than one of these blades, okay? So they're big, and they're very, very efficient. And we think we can get to 20% wind, but in order to get higher than that, we need a bunch of other things that I don't have time to go into. So in the Economic Recovery Act, there's uh, stimulus money, and we think that with the stimulus money, there will be an uptick in the amount of renewable energy. That's good, but we need to continue that momentum. Another thing that I feel very important is we should restart and we must restart our nuclear industry. It's been dormant for 30 years. Uh, the Westinghouse AP1000, which is now, Westinghouse is now, the major owner is now a Japanese company, but there's still a lot of American engineers doing this. This appears to be a very, very good design. Uh, it's natural, it's passively safe. It's, it looks like it's gonna be much less expensive than the older design, it's much safer. There are nuclear waste issues, but I personally think these are solvable and um, nuclear proliferation issue is more of a concern and we require international cooperation, but again, it's solvable. Today, the United States generates 20% of its power by nuclear energy. Um, again, we were the world leader, but we're no longer the world leader. We have a very good shot at recapturing this if we cultivate it in the right way. We need to improve energy storage. You know, when the wind stops blowing, when the sun stops shining, we still want our power. So how do you do that? Here's one way of doing it. This is a hydroelectric dam. If you have wind turbines, you can actually pump the water up a little to a little reservoir. And then when you want the electricity, you'll just let it sluice back down through the generator again. This is incredible. This nowadays is 70 to 85% efficient. That means the amount of electricity needed to pump the water up the hill and the amount of electricity you get back going down the hill means you lose perhaps 20% of the energy. But it's massive amount of storage. And so we, surprisingly, the United States has not really developed pump storage. Now the Department of Energy runs the Bonneville Power Administration. It's in the Pacific Northwest. It's a power generating uh, organization, association. 20% of its power is wind, 80% hydro. And yet, and because it's 20% wind and because the wind can stop blowing, they actually now have to keep fossil fuel generators like gas burners up with the boilers hot just in case the wind stops blowing. Instead of that, what we have is the possibility of pumping 
water from one reservoir to another, <clears throat> and the response time is about a second. It's actually faster than uh, the response time of a conventional power plant. Uh, you won't need to keep as many of these boilers hot. And so we're now embarked on a plan. Let's look at all our resources in the United States, figure out how we can develop pumped hydro. Um, so a number of other things. Um, there's a reason why oil, gasoline, diesel, jet fuel is used so widely, especially in transportation. And the reason is the figure of merit for a transportation fuel is that it has to have high energy density. High energy density in terms of the amount of energy per unit volume, high energy density in terms of energy per unit weight. And if you look at uh, these chemical forms of energy, you find that diesel fuel, gasoline, kerosene is jet fuel, or body fat are at the highest levels. So there's a reason why when you eat too much, you store the energy as body fat, because that's the highest density. You don't store it as carbohydrates, because you know, there's this mobility problem, and so you want to be able to still move around and still have lots of energy. That's the idea. Um, where are batteries? Batteries are down here near zero. <laughs> In fact, it's so close to zero, I thought I'd show you the numbers. Whereas body fat or jet fuel are 38 to 43, million joules per kilogram, a lithium ion battery is 0.54 million joules per kilogram, almost a factor of 80 less. So, so do you think we can ever replace them? The answer is actually yes, because the internal combustion engine weighs a lot more. And so a battery that's out here, maybe five times better, would actually revolutionize the uh, personal vehicle industry. Uh, but it's got to have other things. It's got to last for the lifetime of the car, 15 years, instead of the lifetime of, you know, your laptop battery lasts two or three years and it's lost half the capacity. Um, it's got to cost a lot less. It's got a, a few of other things, but it really would change things. Now, here's a quiz, surprise quiz question. What does a Boeing 777 have in common with a bar-tailed godwit? Now, what's a bar-tailed godwit? It's a bird. Uh, this is what it looks like. It's about this big, okay? And what they have in common is they can fly both very long distances, uh, 11,000 kilometers, seven, over 7,000 miles, nonstop, nonstop. So this bird, for whatever reason, um, actually migrates from Alaska to New Zealand every year and back. And it can do it nonstop. There's another migratory path that has a refueling stop in China, but they actually can go nonstop. Um, <laughs> it's incredible because, so this bird, I don't know how, even how it stays awake, but never mind that. <laughs> it, at takeoff, the weight of a 777 is 45% uh, of its weight is in jet fuel. And the bob-tailed godwit, 55% uh, of the weight is in body fat. And so it lands one skinny bird, but, uh, <laughs> uh, and it's just a testament to how high energy density uh, liquid transportation fuel is. Okay, we also have to discover some new breakthroughs. The developed countries have to reduce their carbon output by over 80%. Uh, it is very necessary because it, we need to give the developing countries headroom because if you're really poor, you need to use more energy and you will necessarily create more carbon dioxide. But the United States right now, with its roughly 300 million people in a world of 6.5 billion people is less than 5% of the world population and yet we consume somewhere between 23 to 24% of the total world energy. So in order to allow the developing countries to come up, we've got to reduce energy, but, but we don't want to give up our prosperity. And so for that, we to decrease our carbon emissions by 80%, we don't have some of those technologies. And so what we need is we need some really game-changing technologies that, are on, that will depend on breakthroughs in fundamental science, but they also have to be applied. And so this is a, a famous graph of what's called Pasteur's Quadrant. 